Well, good morning. Happy Monday. It is Monday, November 11th. It's Monday, November 11th, 2024. And uh, 50, uh, 54 degrees outside this morning. Beautiful morning. A little bit overcast, which I think kept the heat in a little bit. So it's a beautiful morning. Uh, it's also Veterans Day today. So uh, today's the day we thank veterans, uh, appreciate their service and uh, all they do to help keep us free. Freedom does not come uh, without a cost, and uh, the veterans are the ones who uh, have paid the most of that cost, so we appreciate them. Today there's a special Veterans Day assembly uh, at Christ Lutheran Vale for the, at the school, and uh, it's kind of, this will be the third or fourth time we've done this assembly. We, <laughs> the royal we, um, that the, the kids of the school have done the assembly. And it's really quite a, a quite a nice little uh, thing that happens. So we appreciate that. Um, if you are a veteran, thank you so much for your service. I appreciate it. Uh, and may God bless you today as we remember and honor all those who've served. Um, let's see, what else? Um, had a good weekend, a beautiful weekend, a little bit cold, <laughs> but, uh, it was a good weekend to, uh, to rest a little bit, um, from all of the labors and, uh, we're going to actually talk about that today. So, um, let's see what else we have a birthday today, Carol Whitlock, a uh, happy birthday to Carol. May God bless your day today. Where did that go? Yeah. Carol, Carol Whitlock. Um, it's been, uh, her husband Wally's oh, about three or four years during COVID, um, Wally passed away. So we remember Carol today and pray for God's grace today for that. Um, let's see what else I think, uh, is that about it? Um, yeah, we have, um, Thanksgiving is coming up in a couple weeks. So we're looking forward to that. Just as some housekeeping, I will not be here the week of Thanksgiving. The um, I've got a conference that's Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday in Phoenix. It's a mandatory concert conference <laughs> by the Pacific Southwest District, of which we are a part. And then we go to Chicago to uh, to spend Thanksgiving with the family there. And we're flying out of Phoenix because flying out of Tucson was... Was it eight hundred dollars round trip a person or something like that? And flying out of Phoenix was considerably cheaper, so we're flying out of Phoenix for that. All right, um, and I think uh, that's about it. Let's let's go to let's go into our study today, which is Hebrews chapter four. We've been learning that Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is uh, greater than Moses. And then the author of Hebrews talks about the, pro the people of the promised land, the, the Hebrews that left out of Egypt to go into the promised land and how they, they wandered for 40 years because of their disbelief that God was going to bring them to the promised land, but they did not have faith that they would make it to the promised land. And so for 40 years, they wandered in the desert until they finally came up to the promised land. But the author of Hebrews says that it's because of their disbelief that they didn't um, enter into rest sooner. That's kind of his premise. And he's going to pick up on that topic as we move into chapter four. So let's go to chapter four and we'll just start reading in verse one. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So he's making the argument that God still promises rest. The rest that he promised to the Israelites is still available and he's promised everyone to enter into rest. Now, obviously, it's not the rest of the promised land. <laughs> it's a different kind of rest. It's a rest. It's a spiritual rest that we all long for. That uh, that promise of entering into that rest, and we know that rest is is because of Jesus. That if you rest in Jesus, you have rest. You have eternal rest. Verse two: For we also have 
had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter the rest, just as God said, so I declare an oath on my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So he's making the argument here. This is from Psalm 95, and we saw Psalm 95 earlier in in chapter 3. And what he's saying is that if you don't, if you're like an unbelieving Israelite wandering in the desert, you'll never enter into God's rest. Those people don't enter, but those who have believed enter the rest. So those who believe in Jesus enter the rest. And the concept here, and we'll get into it a little bit more, is that rest is something we all covet. We all want rest. (laughs) Some people want rest more than others, right? Some people... um, you know, crave rest. I, what I've noticed is that as people get older, uh, they crave rest more and more. Um, but rest is something that we look forward to in our physical bodies, but in a spiritual sense, it's also something that we look for spiritually. If you remember in creation, God said on the seventh day, uh, take a rest, take a breath. On the seventh day, God rested. And um, because God rested on the seventh day, we too uh, should also rest on the seventh day. And if if you've ever studied the the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, Why does God, why does God encourage us or command us to remember the Sabbath day? And the answer is because many people fear rest. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Many people fear rest. Because if you're resting, you're not working. You're not being busy. You're not doing things. Life could get out of hand. Um, It takes a little bit of effort to not work on the Sabbath day. You have to prepare the food beforehand but it also takes faith. It takes faith to say, it is worth spending one day where I'm not working so that I can relax, so that I can enter into rest, so I can be at peace with God, peace with the world around me, just enjoy a day of peace. And if you don't do that, if you don't take a day of rest, then life just becomes all about work. And Work is always ahead of us. Work is always something we can spend time on. Um, It takes an amount of discipline to be able to stop work for a day and just rest. It also takes a certain amount of faith to just stop one day and rest. Um, We, there, and this one day of rest that we have would be similar to what it would be like in the Garden of Eden. Now, I'm sure in the Garden of Eden, there was things that Adam and Eve had to do. Um, They had to go collect food. I mean, nothing comes without a price, right? But the idea that life is more than work, and and you should spend a day just resting, uh, is is something that we should, especially people in the United States today, where work is all-encompassing, we should spend some time resting. We really should. And we crave it and we want it. And it's not just physical rest for our bodies, but it's spiritual rest for our souls. That Jesus came and because Jesus offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, we now have the option of living in rest if we have faith to do that. That's basically kind of the argument that he's saying here. Um, and he quotes Psalm 95, kind of quotes Psalm 95 in the negative, where God said to those who are wandering around in the desert, I declared my on oath and my anger that they shall never enter my rest. And why would they never enter into my rest? Well, because they disbelieved that God would rescue them, that God was in charge, that they could enter into rest. But we, because we have the Son of God, because we have Jesus, we can enter into rest. We continue reading. 
and yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter into my rest. So on the seventh day God rested, and God finished his work since the creation of the world. Uh, on the seventh day God rested from all his works. And then he says, they shall never enter. So those who disbelieve will not enter into rest. But those of us who do believe, we can enter into God's eternal rest and peace and security. Um, I think we talked last time about uh, eternal perseverance of the saints. Um, if you are in Jesus and you know that he has rescued you from sin, death, and the power of the devil— if you know he's rescued, then you are at rest. And it's a spiritual rest. It's a rest that says, whatever I do in this world, um, God still loves me and cares for me because I am his and he is holding on to me. And so I can rest in security because of him. And, um, and so we do. We know that God gives us that security through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can enter into rest, spiritual rest. Verse 6, Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not enter your hearts. So, <laughs> uh, what he's saying here, that's actually quite wonderful, is that if you didn't quite get the rest, um, today still remains for some to enter into that rest, uh, since those who formerly had the good news pre preached to them did not understand, did not obey, did not see the rest that was available to them, God gives us another chance to at rest, and he calls that rest today. You today can have that rest. He said a certain day called today, uh, and when he spoke through David, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In other words, if you're not in eternal rest with God right now, today could be a good day to do that. Today would be to offer your heart and your body and your soul to mind and say, God, I'm not at peace. <laughs> I'm, not at, I'm not at rest. And I know that you offer rest, so I offer my whole entire life to you to seek rest because the power of Jesus and who he is in my life, I put my hands in your hands. I put my life in your hands for that rest. And you can do that today if you hear his voice and if you do not harden your hearts. That's offer to anybody to hear the voice of Jesus and to live in his eternal rest and security. So if you don't have rest and security in your life, um, maybe you could consider putting your life in Jesus' hands and saying, okay, God, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Jesus, it's, it's you. I'm ready for you to be in charge. I'm done fighting this myself. I'm done wandering in the wilderness. Uh, I'm done with all the challenges that come with this life. I just want to rest in you. What, who was it that said, uh, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you? Um, that was one of the great church fathers early on. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So what he's saying is that a lot of people work really, really, really hard for salvation. I'm going to do this and this, I'm going to follow all these laws, and they're going to work. And we know that nobody, right, all have fallen short of the glory of God. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All of us will not be able to work to earn our way into heaven, into eternal rest. 
will fight and fight and fight and fight and will come short, will come short every time. But because of Jesus, we don't have to fight. We don't have to work. He did all the work for us. Um, and what, what he's saying is that if Joshua had been able to provide rest for the Israelites, then God wouldn't have spoken about a day in the future where there would be rest, because that day in the future where there's rest is Jesus. Um, and what, what the author is saying here is that the rest of Sabbath is what we're all looking for, but it's not just a physical rest. It's a spiritual rest in Jesus. Verse 12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, um, if you do not bear your soul to God, and in so doing, reveal who you are to God, and then through the power of Jesus, rest in him, even though you have darkness inside of you. It's not true rest. True rest is when the God of the universe looks inside your soul and he judges your thoughts and your attitudes in your heart, and he sees it. And because you've exposed it, of course, it's always exposed to God, but sometimes we think we can hide it from God. <laughs> so it's more for us the ability to be, um, be slain by the Word of God, the law of God, to see how sinful we are, to expose that, to give it up to God, and then to let God give us rest. It's not true rest. Let me put it this way. It's not true rest until we've completely exposed it to God. What would be a good example of this? Let's say you're hiding some um, sin in your life that you know about. You're kind of hoping that God doesn't see it, and you're hoping that the world doesn't see it. And because you've been able to hide it and cover it up for so long and nobody's seen it, you think you're in the clear. And so you think you're resting, but you're not true resting because it hasn't, it hasn't been dealt with. It's, it's, a, it's a sin that hasn't been dealt with. Let me put it that way. And so at some point you might say, I need to deal with this. And so you expose it to God and you say, God, I know that you know that I have this sin in my heart and um, I, I, I think I'm at rest, but I'm not because you see it, but it is still an imperfection in my life that I want to give to you. And so I ask that you see it and that you clean it up. Um, in, uh, in the time before, well, even at the time of Luther, because um, Luther saw so there are um, two sacraments uh, in the most of the Protestant world. It's the sacrament of uh, communion and the sacrament of baptism. Sacred acts that connect us deeper with God. And they do a whole bunch of other things. But Luther also saw another one. It's called confession absolution, which is still practiced in the Roman Catholic Church. You go into the confessional and you bear your sins to the priest, and then he tells you things you have to do to to um, overcompensate, to, you know, remediate those sins. But um, Luther felt that was also, it, even though it wasn't commanded by God, he felt like it was something that was good for the soul. And um, there are still many Protestant churches out there that, that um, do some sort of confession absolution, not like the uh, not like the, the Roman Catholic where you go into a confessional, but we, in our worship service, we do a time of confession absolution. And um, sometimes people challenge me on that and say, well, why are we doing that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, hasn't Jesus already <laughs> cleansed me? Why do I need to bring up more sins to have Jesus cleanse me more? And it's because, it's because of this, because we still have sins that... Um, we haven't brought up to God. And every time there's an opportunity for confession absolution, there's an opportunity for you to 
think about the one sin that you haven't given up to God yet and give it up to him. Because there's always one. There's always, there's always, I mean, for me, it's dozens, if not thousands of sins that I haven't really addressed. Um, anyway, uh, the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and the spirit. In other words, the word of God will come in and will tell you two things. One is it will reveal your sin to you because it's God's word. It's a sword. It reveals the sin. But it also has another edge that it reveals God's grace and his mercy and his love. And uh, the more that we give up to God, the more we open our hearts to God and live a life where we hide nothing from God, the more at peace we are with God. Because um, we know that he knows, and yet he still loves. And uh, this, is, this is basically entering that period of rest in the Garden of Eden. Um, all right, so uh, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must account. But listen to this, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In other words, Jesus became flesh and was tempted. We know that in the wilderness, he was tempted with three powerful temptations. And he resisted all of them through the power of the Spirit and the Word of God. And because Jesus was able to resist every temptation, he lived a perfect life. And God allowed him, therefore, to be the substitutionary atonement for our life when we do not live the life that Jesus wants us to live that God wants us to live. He is our atonement. He's our justification. He is our grace. He is our mercy. He is our high priest who is perfect and can atone for our sins. If you remember in the Old Testament, you can take uh, a dove or a lamb or, or something and go into the temple and offer a sacrifice as an atonement for our sins. Well, Jesus is the perfect high priest that would accept that sacrifice for the atonement of sin. Um, and he is the high priest who uh, is able to empathize with us. He sees our struggles. He sees our weaknesses. He knows everything that we struggle with because he had the same temptations in his life, but he was able to resist. And for that, we're grateful. All right, I think we'll close it there. That ends chapter four. We'll get into chapter five next time. Uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for the beauty of this day. Uh, continue to fill our life with your grace and mercy. Because of Jesus, in his name we pray, amen. And uh, good morning to all of you. Good morning, good morning. Um, yeah, Cindy, are you, uh, are you still out of town? Um, we, uh, we pray for you and Lorenz and your whole family as you uh, mourn the loss of your mother. Um, 95 years, uh, strong in her faith, wonderful. Well, and she has a daughter who's strong in her faith too, so that's not surprising. Um, four birthdays in our family across the country today. Wow. wow. Well, may everything go well on your trip. May you uh, find peace. Uh, may you rest in the comfort of the resurrection. And uh, we look forward to uh, when you're able to return. And um, thank, thank you for the rest of you for joining me today. And I uh, hope you have a great day. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. Take care. Blessings. Bye.